Maine Public Broadcasting Network presents a debate between the candidates for the office of United States Senator from Maine. Margaret Chase Smith is a Republican who is seeking her fifth term in the Senate. William Hathaway is a Democrat who has represented Maine's second congressional district for four terms. Moderating the debate is Dave Platt. Good evening. In addition to the two candidates, we have with us two members of the press whose questions will be the basis for discussion. Kent Ward is state editor of the Bangor Daily News. David Spongen is the chief of the Augusta Bureau of the Associated Press. We'll begin with a question directed at one of the candidates <coughs> who will have three minutes to answer it. The other candidate will also have three minutes to rebut and comment on the same question. The newsman who asked the question in the first place will then have the opportunity to follow it up if he wants to, and a question from the other newsman with answers and follow-up and so on. We'll begin with a question for Mrs. Smith from Kent Ward. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Senator Smith, uh, you, you seem to be somewhat of a, of a heroine with, with the main voter, uh, Republicans in particular, but the electorate in general. And, uh, but yet you, you don't seem to uh, use the conventional trappings of a, of a campaign. You said you don't believe in polls and uh, you, you don't really like debates and you do very little political advertising and not many news releases and no newsletter to your constituents. And I wondered uh, how you uh, might account for your popularity as a main voter. Well, I, if I could uh, give any accounting at all about it, I would say that's a long service that I've given and I do more campaigning the off years than I do on the, uh, the campaign year. Uh, for years, I've taken uh, six or eight weeks immediately following adjournment and covered the state, been in schools and churches and all kinds of groups. Uh, you say I don't like polls or don't believe in polls. Well, I don't because I remember the Dewey Truman polls. And I uh, just think that the polls, are the election day polls are the best. I like that better. As far as publicity and uh, TV and so forth are concerned, I think that the uh, the expenditures are uh, getting more and more, greater and greater. And I think this year is disgraceful over the country, the amount of money that's being spent. It's almost like uh, these political offices were up for sale. And the only way that I seem to have to protest is by showing that it can be done without uh, such means. So I have to be sacrificed. I have to suffer from it because I can assure you that I would like a little TV and a few radio spots and a few newspaper ads myself once in a while. But I think that uh, there must be a time when we get back to campaigning on person-to-person uh, -person campaigning and a reasonable amount of television and radio and, and newspaper. But uh, I think it's a disgrace when millions of dollars are being spent over this country to buy a seat. Mr. Hathaway, any comments? Dave, yeah, thanks, uh, Dave. Uh, Kent, I uh, believe that a, a candidate for public office has to, uh, you know, make himself available to the public and has to use the media just as much as possible. This year I am using the media, uh, television in particular, which is costing me a considerable amount of money. I'll say it's costing me personally. I'm lucky to have many people contributing to my campaign. I haven't had to spend any money myself. Uh, in order to acquaint the people with how I stand on the, on the issues of the day. Uh, during the eight years that I've uh, been in the House, I've been back to the, uh, my congressional district an average of two days a week. I've had a periodic uh, newsletter uh, going out to the people, oftentimes with a questionnaire, so I can find out uh, uh, just exactly what's on their mind. I've maintained uh, two district offices, one in Lewis and one in Bangor, through the eight-year period and these are well staffed. I have another man in Aristic County who's on a part-time basis so that I can keep in uh, constant touch with the people and so that uh, uh, I can uh, better serve their needs. And of course, if I were fortunate enough to be elected to the Senate, I would continue that same uh, practice, so of course, on a, on a statewide basis. Uh, I, it is regrettable, of course, that uh, candidates for public office have to spend as much uh, money as they do, but uh, television costs are, are there, production costs, and the cost of uh, putting them on the screen. Uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, we may be able to uh, find some better way of financing campaigns, probably through the, the tax credit uh, proposal, which uh, will uh, be in effect for the presidential election uh, the next time around. 
And uh, to wind up, as far as polls are concerned, uh, I suppose I should certainly agree with the Bangor Daily News poll. I think candidates are inclined to agree with the polls when they're ahead and uh, not believe them when they're behind. Probably polls have a certain amount of validity. Sure, some of them have been off, but at least they show how the people are feeling at the time the poll is taken. Now, a lot can happen between the time the poll is taken and the time the, of the actual election, or even if the <coughs> poll is taken the day before. Uh, it may indicate that one candidate is ahead, but if his people don't go to the polls and vote the next day, uh, then that candidate may not prevail. Uh, Senator Smith, in, in line with uh, servicing uh, your constituents, uh, uh, there has been some uh, comment, uh, the NATO report, but also in the press, that uh, you may tend to lean too heavily on your administrative assistant, Bill Lewis. Uh, how do you answer this uh, comment? Uh, well, a staff is for the purpose of relying on, I would think, and I am sure that the people realize that uh, I couldn't do the job by myself. However much I might claim to do it, I couldn't do it. Now, my assistant, Bill Lewis, is a very able man. I pay him for being an assistant, and that's exactly what he is. He has four college degrees, which I don't have. He earned college degrees. He has. Uh, been uh, cited by three services in the, for his uh, war record, all three services, Army, uh, Navy, and Air Force, and why shouldn't I rely on him? Now, I, he is very, very helpful. I depend on him a great deal. But going back to the uh, matter of popularity, I think my popularity comes because I have served the people. We get a couple of hundred letters a day answer every letter the day it comes in, almost every day anyway. I'm on the telephone with the people from back home talking about accessibility. I'm on the telephone. I take the telephone calls myself when people want to talk. People won't talk with my people in the office. They won't talk with me. Now, these people who get by with having assistants do that. Now, Bill does a lot of that, but they finally come to me. As far as the NATO report is concerned, I think the timing of it, I think the intent, I think the prejudice of it is very, very obvious. And when uh, the writer, research writer, a Democratic candidate for the state senate here in this county, uh, uh, prepares the material, it's very evident what, what he's up to. Now, as far as accessibility is concerned, I just leave it to the public. I think the public in Maine would say that I was very accessible. I'm always available, and I'm in the state. This year, I've been in the state 100 days, yet I've not missed a vote. Now, I think it can be done, just like I know a campaign can be carried on without this vast expenditure. I, I can't agree. now. I must say that we all campaign differently, and I never criticize my opponent for the way he does, because that's his business. If I prefer to carry on my own way, I, I, that's the way I do it. Mr. Hathaway. Uh, Ken, I believe your question pertains to the role of the staff. Of the administrative, of the administrative assistant or the staff, Administrative yes. assistant, and of course a uh, public official, or a member of the House, or a member of the Senate, does <coughs> rely upon his staff, but I don't rely upon my staff to do my thinking for me. I do delegate an awful lot of casework and uh, some research to, to my staff, and they do an excellent job in, in these regards, but then they present me with the facts, and then I make the judgment or the decision just how to go from there, whether it <coughs> pertains to a vote or pertains to some action that uh, I have to take back here in the state of Maine. Well, I might say right there, Bill, I haven't seen my administrative assistant on tele uh, television programs or out taking my place making speeches or or uh, if, you've, if you're intimating that I'm, he's doing my thinking for me, I hope he does do my thinking for me. I wish he was here to do it now. I don't have any comment on that. <laughs> Dave <Sparrow. coughs> Question for Mr. Hathaway. Congressman Hathaway, uh, you've said that you favor mandatory retirement for congressional members, and I believe you use the age of 70, and also a limitation on the number of terms which can be served. Uh, why do you favor such a concept, and why do you talk about the particular age of 70? Well, uh, to answer the last part of your question first, why do we favor the particular age of 70? Private industry, I don't believe there's any private industry that has uh, retirement at any later age than 70, and some of them have it mandatory at the age of, uh, of, of 65. Uh, we do, in the Constitution, have a lower age limit. Uh, you have to be 25 years of age before you can uh, serve in the House, 30 years of age before you're entitled to serve in the uh, Senate. 
Uh, I think an upper limit is uh, warranted also. I think these broad guidelines are, uh, are necessary in order to get uh, effective representation. Now, in answer to the other part of your question about limiting the number of terms that a House member or a senator can serve, I think that that's in line with the thinking that uh, we uh, uh, place upon the, the governor's job and the, the office of the President of the United States. So both of them, the governor here in the state of Maine and governors throughout this country in other states, some other states, are limited to two terms and the President of the United States is limited to two terms because we don't. I think that members of the House and Senate also should be limited in the number of uh, terms that they can serve so that uh, we do get a rejuvenation of ideas uh, over the years and so that uh, you know, anyone who is in one particular public office for a long length of time gets a vested interest in his own ideas and uh, it's hard to, to shake them. And I think that we do, do need this changeover. I don't mean that a person uh, can't serve, say, four years as, uh, or eight years as governor and then serve so many terms in the Senate and then maybe terms in some other public office. I'm not saying a person cannot devote his entire lifetime uh, to public service of one kind or another. But I am saying that, uh, that uh, he or she ought to be limited uh, within the confines of a particular office, such as the House, the Senate, the Governor, Chip, and the Presidency. Mrs. Smith. Yes, I often think of Prime Minister Churchill. He was at his peak at 81 years old as Prime Minister. He, I suppose history will depict him as one of the greatest, world's greatest statesmen. He didn't become a prime minister until he was 65 years old. And by um, Mr. Hathaway's own formula, which I read in the paper in September, I wonder what would happen to the Democratic Party. It would be certainly be ruined as far as I can see because uh, according to uh, Bill, Bill Hathaway's formula, the Speaker of the House, Carl Elbert, has, uh, I think, uh, been in the House for 26 years. He's uh, surely over 70, but he's been in the House over, 60, over, uh, over 26 years. Uh, your own chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Bill, I think one of the most powerful people in the two bodies, uh, George Mahon, has served 38 years in the House. Now, surely you would not want to get rid of uh, the, uh, such a chairman of appropriations as that. And uh, you have... Uh, uh, have many, of course, the present pro tem in the Senate. Uh, Eastland, uh, you have McClellan, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, uh, 76 years old, uh, one of the ablest in the Senate. Now, I agree that we need new thinking. We certainly need it, and I'm all for younger people coming in, but I think they should come in and work their way up and re be ready to take the places as the people who have been in for a while uh, retire or go out one way or another. I think there's a very great mistaken idea about seniority. It's seniority in service rather than seniority in age. And I, uh, I think the uh, Democratic Party certainly would be decimated if, if your formula was adopted. Well, if I may comment further on that, uh, I, I would like to see George Mahon retire. Uh, Carl Albert, by the way, is not over 70. He's uh, in his early 60s. You may have been thinking of uh, uh, the former speaker, John McCormick. No, I was thinking about the 26 a, years that, that Carl has had is, uh, in the House. But I thought you mentioned that he was over mm -hmm. 70. He isn't uh, over 70. Well, if, if that were the case, I think that he, he should leave. Uh, uh, I think it should, should apply to Democrats as well as Republicans. Somebody asked me the other night uh, on a talking show if I was supporting uh, Wayne Morris for the Senate uh, in Oregon. And I said, uh, no, I wasn't, because uh, he was over 70 years old. Uh, I'm not applying my thinking just to Republicans. I'm applying it on a uh, bipartisan basis. And I think that the country would be better off and better served if we had both of these uh, limitations applied. And although you can always point to exceptions, such as uh, Winston Churchill, you could point to the exception, I suppose, of Manny Seller in the House, who was 82, but was recently uh, defeated in a primary uh, in New York. Uh, I think that by and large, uh, that uh, the uh, service of people uh, at, at that age is not as energetic and is uh, not as progressive because they, as I mentioned earlier, do have this vested interest in their own ideas and think that the 
Congress and the country uh, really can't survive without them, uh, then that's the, the, the principal reason, really, for asking them to step down at the age of 70. Wouldn't but even after that, I suppose they can always serve in advisory capacity. They write books and they uh, give lectures and so forth. But, uh, Margaret, you know that the demands of the, the job of the House and of the Senate both of getting back to the state of Maine, as I mentioned, getting back uh, an average of two days a week and to serving uh, the, the people requires a, a great deal of energy, uh, requires uh, many long days, 12 to 16 hours a day, uh, and I think that those demands are, uh, are simply too great uh, for people who are uh, over the age of 70. Wouldn't you that think that depended somewhat on the person? Uh, have you seen any deterioration in the service that I've given uh, in the Senate? Uh, I've heard you talk about it outside, and I uh, understand how you feel, but I never miss a vote, for instance. Yet I never miss a month coming to Maine. I've been to Maine. I've been to Maine at least once a month through my entire career. It does take effort. It does take energy. You can't play golf and play cards and do all the rest of the things that people do and do it and keep your keep your health. Thank God I've had health to do it. And I've never seen a time when I have thought that experience was a handicap. And I think in these crucial days. You've had it in the House, and I'm not complaining, because I think these crucial days, people with experience are needed, and needed very, very badly. I'd like to get back to our newsmen, if I might. They're <laughs> earning their pay as well as the rest. Yes. Kent? Uh, Dave, I'd like to ask uh, Congressman Hathaway a question. Uh, uh, I seem to have sensed uh, that you more or less disassociated yourself from uh, Senator McGovern's campaign at the top of the ticket. Is this so, and, and also in line with the same thing? Can you tell me where you agree and disagree with the senator? No, Kent, I have not disassociated myself with George McGovern. I'm supporting George McGovern for President of the United States, and I hope he's elected President of the United States, and I think he'd be an excellent President of the United States. Uh, I do not agree with George McGovern on all of his stands, but I haven't agreed with a lot of other presidential candidates and all of their stands. And on amnesty, for example, uh, I am not in favor of uh, amnesty, and George McGovern does have a modified amnesty proposal. I am in favor of some of the defense cuts, uh, cuts in the defense appropriation, which George McGovern favors, but not, not all of them. I think he's in favor of some $30 billion of cuts over the next uh, two or three years. Uh, my cuts would come to about a little, just a little over 20 uh, billion dollars. I did not favor his uh, plan of giving a thousand dollars to each individual in the country. Of course, he did change that plan uh, after a while, but I did not favor it at the time that he came out with it. Mrs. Smith? I don't think I have any comment on Senator McGovern. He's the uh, candidate for the Democratic Party for president. I certainly don't agree with him. I think that his proposal to cut thirty billion dollars from defense would be disastrous. He goes into all these states and says he's not going to cut out any facilities. It amuses me because I wonder how you're going to cut $30 billion out of a defense budget. I think you're right. I think there are places for, for economy in the defense budget. I think there are, and there's a very great need. But I think they must come uh, by way of uh, less duplication, less uh, overlapping, less inefficient, fewer inefficiencies, less overruns. Uh, greater care, but it must be remembered that 62% of the entire defense budget is for people. And if we're going to have a voluntary army as we're aiming at, uh, we have to pay in order to get those people. So when Mr. <coughs> McGovern says that he's going to cut the budget $30 billion, now they say it's $10 billion a year. When I heard him say it, he said $30 billion, he said $30 billion now. Uh, so I don't have to comment on Senator McGovern. I think it would be disastrous to have him President of the United States. Uh, you, uh, Senator Smith, uh, you feel then that if, if uh, his cuts were to be made that they would, would affect uh, Maine, Salations, Loring Air Force Base, Kittery, uh, Portsmouth, uh, Bath? Uh, well, it must, cut, it must affect some facilities, some place, because you couldn't, uh, you couldn't go on uh, with a $30 billion cut, a $50 billion budget rather than an $80 billion budget or at least I don't see with my knowledge of it. And uh, he's, he sent a letter in here, and I, st I again smiled the other day. He's been shedding crocodile tears about this Lytton contract uh, not coming up to Bath. 
Well, I checked the record, and on September 1, 1970, Mr. McGovern voted against the Muskie-Smith Amendment that would have split that contract and given Bath 30, 30 destroyers. Sure, he would, uh, from all that I can see, he'd do away with the, most of the Navy. Well, if we can still comment on that sure. uh, particular issue, I don't think George McGovern's proposal would do away with most of the Navy. He's in favor of the uh, nuclear submarine program, which would go a long way towards helping uh, defense industry at Portsmouth. I know of no cuts that he's advocated as far as uh, destroyers are concerned, which is the principal activity of the of the Bath Ironworks. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Margaret mentioned the uh, cuts. Uh, the, the, the defense budget is composed a large part of personnel cuts, and that's where you can cut uh, considerably. We have a 14 billion dollar commitment in Western Europe. And uh, certainly, I think we could cut that in half and save that $7 billion and put it into some more worthwhile programs, such as education. Well, I think, uh, if I may comment right there, I think we have to be very, very careful of our defenses. I think we must have adequate defense. Peace comes through strength. and National security is number one. Education, all the welfare programs in the world are going to be no avail at all unless we have proper national, uh, have national security. Without proper defense, and the thing I'm saying about Senator McGovern, he's never pinpointed it. He just says, cut $30 billion, and then sends word into the various states that he's not going to cut in those states. This is the, the complaint that I have about Senator McGovern, but I uh, don't think I need to worry about him. Well, the final comment is that uh, George McGovern has put out a detailed analysis of just where he would cut. He hasn't said simply that he's just going to cut $30 billion, and naturally we're all in uh, favor of our national security, but we already have enough nuclear weapons to kill the world's population many, many times over, and I think that we can make some sensible cuts in the defense budget and still uh, maintain uh, our national security. Dave Swearingen, question for Mrs. Smith. Yes, uh, Mrs. Smith, one of the, uh, you said one of the reasons you're seeking another term is because of the continuity of service, your service in the Senate is of prime importance to Maine citizens. Could you tell us um, why you feel such continuity of service is important, uh, important and why it should be considered by the voters on election day? I think continuity, uh, continuity of service is important for anyone. I think this is one of the reasons why it's so important to re-elect President Nixon. The continuity of his service, for instance, he has started many things, including uh, coming pretty close to the end of the war. I think he should have time to go on. Now, as a member of the, I'm a second ranking member of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate. Uh, the top ranking uh, member of the Armed Services Committee and the second ranking uh, member of the uh, uh, Space Committee. Uh, I uh, sp spend most of my time in armed services, although of course I'm very busy on appropriations. And I'm sure that I can do more uh, for, the, for my state and for the country with the experience that I've had and the knowledge that I have in appropriations than new people could do. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I overestimate my value. I uh, could very well. I'd be prejudiced. But I can't believe that uh, anyone coming in uh, to take my place at this time uh, could do the things for Maine. I, I think if you would check the people in Maine, it's often said if you want anything done in Washington, write Margaret Smith. And uh, this is the reputation that I have built up. I take care of the individual requests. I take care of the individual calls. And I, I think this a person with my, uh, with my seniority in service, or seniority in age, as far as that's concerned, it can do more than someone who comes in fresh, with no, with no standing in the Senate at all. Mr. Hathaway. Well, if we were to follow your argument, Margaret, though, then I suppose no one who was in office would ever be defeated because they would simply say, that, <laughs> you've got to keep me in office uh, because I've been there longer than the person who is challenging me. I think, as I mentioned earlier, that we, we do need fresh approaches to problems. We do need uh, new ideas. Uh, we do have to uh, energize the system. And uh, I'm not a candidate who has no experience whatsoever. I have served. Uh, eight years in the House uh, and uh, have gained a considerable amount of experience uh, that way. The, the seniority system, for example, in both the House and the Senate, 
uh, has been watered down uh, over the years, so it isn't as effective as it was at one time. Actually, the seniority system in and of itself is not uh, what uh, sometimes makes uh, both bodies, the House and the Senate, lag. It's the uh, power structure that's within the committees by giving committee chairmen, uh, you know, so much power <coughs> and subcommittee chairmen so much power. It wouldn't make any difference whether they were appointed in accordance with the number of years they had served or they just threw darts at the wall at the names of House and Senate members and picked them that way. If they inherited this particular power, uh, then they could uh, uh, exercise it and, and abuse it. But uh, over the years, this has been watered down. I think particularly true in the, in the Senate where many times, uh, many amendments or to committee bills are offered on the floor uh, and much more work actually is done on the floor of the Senate than probably on the floor of the House, although that uh, has increased substantially uh, just in the past uh, two years. So the committee structure in neither body is as strong as it uh, used to be. And as far as, uh, you know, serving on the Armed Services Committee, uh, as, you, as you do, Margaret, uh, you, as you know, uh, defense contracts are, are subject to uh, a bidding procedure. You can't say that an individual, either in the House or the Senate, uh, can influence the bidding procedure. It's a, it's a violation of law for any uh, House member or any senator to influence the bidding procedure uh, for either defense contracts or for uh, sh maritime ships, for example. David, any follow-up? Uh, I might just add, may I add something there? I might add something since uh, Mr. Hathaway's brought up the matter of seniority. Uh, the committee system. I think it's. I think really it is unfortunate that the committee system is breaking down. So, as chairman of the Republican Senatorial Confer uh, Conference, which I am, um, last January, strange it may seem, uh, not having any new ideas as you intimate, I appointed a a committee on the Republic of Republican Senators, and uh, directed that committee to come in with some recommendations for changes in committee uh, appointments uh, on the senior, uh, to change the seniority system. That report came in just before I came away. It will be presented to the conference the 1st of January, whoever is chairman of that conference, and I think some of the proposals be, will be uh, adopted. And one of them is a very good one. I've never been able to find a way that would change the seniority system to, for the good. It's bothered me a lot because I don't like it. I, a lot of things I don't like about it. But this proposal that comes in by this subcommittee that I appointed uh, will change hmm. that so that the conference can, anyone in the conference can uh, become a member, uh, can uh, be a nominee for that committee, regardless of the, what the Committee on Committees does. So I'm not so far behind, uh, really, Bill, as you Excuse would me. indicate. We're just about out of time. Do you have any further comments, Mr. Hathaway? No, I'm glad to see that the seniority system and the power structure in the Senate is, uh, has a good chance of being broken down so that each individual senator uh, has an opportunity to express himself and has a, a chance to uh, get his ideas heard by in, in that forum. We have about 30 seconds left. Shall we split it, Senator? I have nothing further to add, except I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm most grateful to you for letting me come on the program. David and Kent and David again, I'm, uh, I've enjoyed being on this program with you. I thank you very much. And as a final word, I hope the people will, all people will exercise their privilege we have in the society and go over the polls and vote uh, on Tuesday. I'd like to thank all the participants in this last of the main public broadcasting network's three political debates prior to election 72. Thanks to Margaret Chase Smith and Bill Hathaway for agreeing to this joint appearance. Special thanks to Kent Ward of the Bangor News and Dave Swearingen of the Associated Press. This is Dave Platt.